Uh, okay, thank you. So I hope that uh, you can hear me and uh, you can also see the slides. Is that the case? Yes, okay, we can. Right. Yes. Um, okay, so thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. It's a, a kind of uh, a strange event because I was asked to give uh, absolutely uh, non-technical talk uh, without equations, preferably. Uh, so I'll try to do my best, uh, but anyway, uh, in the end, uh, there will be something uh, uh, maybe of interest. Uh, so uh, I accepted the challenge, and uh, I think that uh, there is a, is a saying that uh, one should be able to explain uh, uh, one's research uh, to a friend who is not familiar with, with the field of research uh, when you are sitting at a bar. So um, this is, uh, this is uh, something I would like to try to do, right? So you can imagine that we are sitting at a bar. Uh, well, anyway, the hour is late. And uh, we are talking about the research. So you can op open your bottle of wine and uh, I will do the talking. So it's uh, about uh, materials and how to describe them, about mathematical modeling and quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, to give you a context, I've promised that uh, I will go briefly through the history of uh, subject. It's a kind of very biased personal uh, 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 comment on the history of continuum mechanics. So you are, be, uh, you are warned, so let's start. So as, uh, as everything in, uh, in uh, modern physics, uh, everything starts with uh, Galileo Galilei. Right? In the uh, uh, 17th century, he's called father of modern science and it's uh, a very good uh, nickname to say. Uh, so he wrote uh, several books, uh, most of them uh, without mathematics because the technical tools uh, at that time were not uh, available. But uh, he was an excellent writer and uh, I would say that the books are a pleasure to read. Uh, so you can try to do it. Unfortunately, in Czech, there is no translation, complete translation of his work. Uh, but uh, at least uh, you will get a kind of impression from, for, for example, from English translations. So this is uh, one, of, one of the books uh, he wrote. Uh, this is uh, about two new sciences. This is the title page of, of that book. And uh, well, what, what is interesting here, and again, uh, this is something that uh, will you will see uh, in, in continuum mechanics quite frequently and in your scientific life, you can note this picture. Right? So this picture, uh, if you remember, if uh, you had a chance to uh, publish uh, a paper in an Elsevier publishing house, so this is the same picture. Right? So the Elsevier publishing house was existing in uh, 16... Uh, 30, 1640 in Netherlands at that time. And uh, they have a really long tradition. Right? So this is uh, just a remark that uh, this picture is quite old and still alive, right? like, as, like continuum mechanics. But what is, what is more important, what is, uh, what is uh, in the book? So let's see what is inside. Well, many of you were attending my lectures on continuum mechanics, so you probably know this picture. So it's my favorite. So what is there? It, again, it's, it's a book on continuum mechanics. As I said, no equations. The only trace of science is that they were denoting uh, uh, things by letters A, C, D. So it looks like a scientific book, but uh, actually it's not because there's no equation there. But anyway, they were uh, interested in, uh, in basic stuff in continuum mechanics. So uh, Galilei was a father of uh, what is now called uh, strength of materials. So they noticed that, for example, if you have a cantilever beam that looks like this, then uh, if you place it uh, like this and uh, you attach a weight to that cantilever beam, 
then the deflection will be uh, greater in this case than in this case. So this is a basic observation. Well, everyone who was interested in construction at that time knew that, but uh, now that well, but uh, uh, Galilei started a kind of scientific investigations into that. And, and another picture like that, right? So uh, something highly symbolic, and then you can see a beautiful engraving of an old building with all this uh, uh, windows, stones, and uh, you know, plants, and so on. So this this is a this is a book. Well, essentially, there was nothing there at, at that time. The, the biggest achievement was, for example, the shape of uh, uh, of a suspension. Well, at that time it was not a suspension bridge. So let's say a shape of chain that is uh, freely hanging between two points. Well, he derived a formula for that. The formula was wrong, um, but anyway. Uh, something started and, and this is a problem for example this one so the cantilever beam so you can uh, trace it through the history of continuum mechanics so everyone was trying to do something with it right if you have a new material the first thing you do for it uh, you will test the predictions of your model in this setting for example so you will see it many many times so going uh, to uh, the mathematization of the subject matter, so the first uh, kind of mathematical statement was made or is attributed uh, to be precise to Robert Hooke. And this is, uh, this is the famous uh, Hooke's law, right? So uh, um, nowadays we are writing it like this. Uh, it's a, a simple non-technical formula. I, can, I hope that you can see some writing right in, in the slide, yes. Yes. So uh, his discovery is, uh, is uh, in a certain sense, very primitive, right? So force is proportional to relative deformation or uh, S extension, so the force, this was his statement. So from, from the mathematical perspective, it's, it's trivial, right? So it's a proportional relation, proportionality relation between two quantities, but uh, uh, from another perspective, it's a big, a big achievement because in order to say something like this, something like this, you need the concept of force. Right? And this was something that was missing in the history of science before that. Right? You need to, to know what is force, and you need to know that if, if you write it in a slightly different way, that force is e epsilon, then this is the right thing to put to the right-hand side of uh, Newton's law, right? And this is a non-trivial piece of information. Mathematically, it's trivial. Uh, the, the meaning behind it is, uh, is essential, right? So Robert Hooke, uh, we have Hooke's law and we have also the main players. So I will uh, recall the names. So this is called nowadays strain, or you can think of relative deformation. And this is stress, still uh, a one-dimensional uh, equation relating these two quantities. And of course, uh, if we are going through the, through the history uh, of, uh, of science, then uh, obviously uh, we have to talk about Leonard Euler. And this was uh, kind of first uh, important contribution that uh, was important from the practical point of view. And again, uh, it has been uh, studied many and many times, basically for, uh, for every uh, new material model, you can do this problem. So what is the problem? So this is a problem for a buckling of a column. So this is a column. This is uh, something that is made of an elastic material. And the column is uh, subject to a weight. Again, scientific letter for that P, right? And uh, what uh, you can expect is that uh, if you have a column that is attached to the ground and you have a weight, some force acting on it, then uh, if it is made from elastic material, then this is always uh, the solution, right? So it will, according to Hooke's law, it will get uh, uh, shorter, and that's it. 
But what is what was uh, uh, fundamental contribution by Euler? He did it very carefully. Uh, he found that uh, before, well, if the load reaches a critical value, then uh, what will actually happen is that uh, the column will buckle to the side. So this is, this is uh, important uh, from the practical point of view, because in, in this case, the material will still not uh, fail. And, uh, it, will not, it won't be damaged, it won't break. Right? But from the practical perspective, the buckling is as dangerous as the damage of the material. Right? If you have a structure that buckles to the side, subject to the load, then uh, you are doomed. And what he was able to do, he was able to calculate the critical load. So this is a picture from, uh, from his uh, work. And this was later done by Lagrange, that then uh, Lagrange considered also the buckling that uh, is of uh, sinusoidal shape and so on, higher modes, basically. So <clears throat> again, if, if you want to... Uh, read something technical about uh, Euler buckling with a lot of references. Uh, uh, you can try to check, uh, if you can try to read this paper. Right? Uh, it's uh, Proceedings of Royal Society, so we will see that uh, this journal uh, played an important role in, uh, in uh, continent mechanics. So this was Euler and Euler buckling. Another important thing uh, in, uh, in continent mechanics is the concept of stress answer. So again, what was before, so Hook was writing something like this, E epsilon. Cauchy was the first uh, person, well, to a certain extent, uh, who was able to write uh, the one-dimensional or an analog of one-dimensional Hook's law as uh, a relation between two tensorial quantities. Right? So these are three times three matrices. And again, uh, this is a kind of trivial observation, but uh, on the other hand, uh, a very, very tricky one, right? because, well, this is about physics. We are somewhere in 1820, 1830. So you can imagine how technically complicated was mathematics at that time already. Right, so these are, this is the time where people were interested uh, in transcendency of Euler number and transcendency of pi and so and such a stuff. And this simple the kind of relation between three times three matrices or tables at that time, uh, this was uh, the discovery uh, to Cauchy. So all the theorems in complex analysis basically uh, are due to him, and these are technically difficult. Right? But uh, this trivial observation, again, is maybe much more important than, uh, than everything he did in, in complex analysis. So this is the classical tetrahedron argument. Then, if you want to see uh, uh, some uh, more serious work about the concept of Cauchy stress tensor, uh, you can try to read uh, read this paper. All the relevant references are there. It's a very, very interesting story. But uh, for us, the important thing is that uh, Cauchy and we have stress, concept of stress tensor. Next thing, uh, this is uh, a man who is uh, kind of unknown, but uh, he did uh, fundamental contributions to several things. It's uh, George Green. Uh, it's almost impossible to get a picture of him. I don't think, the, well, probably there exists some, but uh, I was not able to get it. And there's a reason for that. George Green, he was a very, a very interesting person. Uh, he got almost no formal education. He was taught how to read and write. And then he spent the rest of his life as a miller, right? So this is a windmill. He was uh, sitting there as a miller. He was managing uh, the windmill. And well, in his free time, 
he developed the concept of green functions, green identities, and he was the first person who realized that uh, certain functions are given as a gradients of something. Right? So for the velocity field, for example, you have uh, a scalar potential. And for us, the, the, the important business in uh, continuum mechanics is uh, the relation between the stress and strain energy. Right? So incredible, uh, incredible man, really it's a very, very interesting history. Uh, and of course, his work was also essential for the development of electricity and magnetism. Right? So uh, you see uh, his identities everywhere, basically. Okay, so uh, if, if, if you want, uh, so it was not like that, right? But uh, he is kind of the first uh, person was uh, thinking about stress uh, in terms of derivatives of the potential. So this is uh, a modern form of that. And interestingly, it was not, uh, not in the paper on elasticity, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, in paper on propagation of light in crystals. Right? So even the, the title of the, of the paper is not something like we have a potential for stress. But this is the, the title of his paper is something like reflection of light in crystals. But the, the concept of potential, this is uh, his invention or discovery. Okay, and then uh, we are in the age of industrial revolution. So this is this one. So usually uh, people think that uh, all the computations that are being done in, uh, for example, linearized elasticity, this is uh, the modern buzzword is key enabling technology, right? So key enabling whatever. The truth is that if you want to build a structure like this, you don't need it at all, right? So you don't, even, you don't need a concept of potential. You don't need a concept of stress. All you need to do is all you need to use is uh, something that uh, dates back to Euler and Bernoulli and Galileo strength of materials. But this is essential, right? So you see that this is a kind of structure that is built of uh, uh, beams and they should not buckle. Right? So this is the computation they, they did kind of. And of course, again, uh, mathematics or physics is not important here. Uh, to a certain extent, because the, the difficulty here is to uh, manufacture the steel in sufficient amount, in sufficient quality, make it cheap, with consistent quality, and so on. This is material science, basically chemistry, so not, uh, not continuum mechanics. Okay, but uh, again, uh, if, you, if you are going to build a structure like this without, uh, without knowing too much uh, about the deformation of materials, you are over-engineering the structure. So it's heavier than it uh, could be, and so on and so on. So you are wasting a lot of material, probably. So still, it makes sense to, to study, uh, study uh, continuum mechanics. Uh, so what happened after that? Uh, so in between uh, First War and the Second World War, there was an amount, enormous amount of works that were focused on analytical solutions in linearized elasticity. The classical classical books uh, that summarize uh, the the outcomes are, for example, this one, uh, Love's book on elasticity. It's, maybe 600 pages with analytical solutions of various problems in the nice elasticity. Uh, this book, this is basically applications of complex analysis in 2D problems in elasticity. Uh, Timoshenko, this is, this is a book uh, that was again uh, reprinted many times, wave motion solid. So people did a lot of stuff uh, in elasticity and in the linearized elasticity. Of course, well, it's a linear theory, so it was a good playground uh, for uh, working with partial differential equations. Right? Uh, so we can do all the tricks 
you were taught uh, in the first three years here, and uh, you can solve many problems. So this is convenient from, from, the, from the mathematical point of view, and this is also convenient from the perspective of uh, design of structures that are made of steel. Because the basic, uh, basic assumption behind the linearized elasticity uh, is that uh, you are working with small deformations. And uh, this basically makes the, the theory linear. Right. So uh, instead of uh, something that is nonlinear, here it's a product of two things. It's not important what it is, but anyway, I've checked the list of participants. So okay, so maybe all, all of you know about this. So this is called linearized strain, and this is the quantity that is uh, fundamental in linearized elasticity. So linearized elasticity is a linear theory. And what's wrong with it, uh, it can be explained uh, very easily. So let us check uh, what uh, the linearized elasticity tells us about uh, rotations, right? So this will be a slightly technical. So we are sitting at a bar, so I'm taking a napkin and I'm trying to write something on a napkin, just a few equations. So if your deformation is described by something like this, where Q is proper orthogonal matrix, so this is this one, then the quantity B minus identity, this is where F is the gradient of this thing with respect to capital X. So this is Q. So B minus identity is Q, Q transpose minus identity, and this is zero. That's good. Because your Cauchy stress tensor is somehow related to B minus identity. And if this is zero, so you'll see no stress. So that's good. If your body is rotating, you will see no stress. Now, if you do the same calculation for epsilon, you will arrive to the conclusion that epsilon is not equal to zero, right? So the linearized elasticity predicts that if you take a body that looks like this and you will just rotate it, then um, you will see stress in the body. Of course, it's an approximation, so uh, you must be careful about the amount of rotation but uh, this, is, this is basically one of, the, one of the problems with linearized elasticity. If you have large rotations, then you should be very careful. And of course, well, people uh, know that or knew that uh, at that time. So they were careful to use uh, linearized elasticity in settings where this is not happening. Right? So they, were, they knew how to compensate for it how to get rid of this, uh, this paradox and so on. But uh, the message is linearized elasticity is a, is a bad theory. Okay, so let's see uh, what happened after that. Uh, the, the fundamental paper in this, uh, in uh, finite elasticity is this one. So this is again, paper that was published in Proceedings of the Royal Society, there are several things that are worth of mentioning. First one, you can look the affiliation. Right? I don't know whether you can read it, but uh, the affiliation is British Rubber Produces Research Association. Right? So this is the time where people abandoned steel for a rubber. And the rubber is a material where you can really observe large elastic deformations, right? So for steel, it doesn't matter. You can do linearized elasticity. And you are fine. For a rubber, uh, you can really deform the, the rubber such as, uh, in such a way that uh, the deformation is visible by naked eye. And of course, for, for these people, uh, the, the linearized elasticity was something that uh, was basically useless. So this is why British Rubber Producers as a Research Association. 
Uh, the man behind it is uh, Rivlin, you know the name uh, from, uh, from lectures on continuum mechanics. Uh, the second interesting thing is that uh, the birth of finite elasticity is something that uh, dates back to 1947. Right? So you can imagine at that time, many, uh, let's say, abstract physical theories, uh, general relativity, quantum mechanics, they were reasonably well developed. Right? But the basic things about deformations of solids, they were properly understood uh, in 1950s, 1940s. Right, so this is uh, again a very very interesting paper. There's actually a series of uh, five papers where he's solving uh, solving the equations for finite elasticity. Uh, so why finite elasticity? So you might think, and sometimes people do that, that a linear that the nonlinear elasticity or finite elasticity is just about the, uh, this thing, right? So linearized setting means sigma is E epsilon, that's the linearized elasticity. And the nonlinear elasticity means, okay, so who cares? So we will have a different curve here where sigma is a function of epsilon quadratic, say. And that's it, it's about curve fitting. Right, so instead of uh, uh, fitting uh, the the curve with a linear relation, you do something nonlinear and you are done. This is not true, uh, at least partially, because uh, the nonlinearity of the of the geometrical deformation it brings uh, many new qualitative effects. So again, as I told you, our favorite material is now rubber. Right, so but this is probably a kind of obscure journal, India rubber journal. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but uh, there's a there's a fundamental observation there by pointing, and the title of the paper is instructive: the changes in length and volume of an Indian rubber cord when twisted. So, in more technical terms, so what it is? So you can imagine that you have a cylinder and you will twist it, right? So you will take uh, the top face and you will rotate it. And what is important uh, to notice here, uh, this letter here is Psi, right? So this is uh, basically the, the, the angle of rotation there. And now you can try to find out what is uh, the torque necessary for uh, such a deformation. Right, so how much force you need to rotate that piece of material. What is remarkable here, then this uh, torque is proportional to psi, to this quantity. So proportion. So this is a result you can recover to a certain extent also by the linearized theory. Right, so the deformation that is measured by psi, and you have a kind of stress here, so they are proportional. Fine. So you can do it using linearized elasticity. But the other thing, Fz is a force that is uh, generated in the cylinder when it's uh, twisted, and the force is acting in the direction of the z-axis, right? So if you try to twist the cylinder, you must also a little bit squeeze it. And the force that is acting in the z direction is proportional to the psi squared. So this is definitely beyond the reach of uh, the linearized elasticity. This thing, you will see it only if you, uh, uh, you do the geometry properly, the finite, deformation setting, right? So the take home message is, okay, rubber. And if you do uh, crazy things to uh, a rubber cylinder, you will get uh, effects that are beyond curve fitting. 
So concerning the torque, maybe, okay, yes, so we will have an, another relation here, so who cares? But uh, concerning the force in the Z direction, it will be completely off. There is no chance here. So new qualitative effect. And of course, uh, well, uh, after that, uh, that, uh, that paper in uh, 1947, uh, people went crazy and uh, they tried to uh, develop formulas for the Cauchy stress tensor in terms of derivatives of the potential, right? So this is uh, just kind of two streams in the history. So green, you have a potential, and uh, rivlin, so you need to consider uh, finite deformations. And probably you can't see it, so I'll try to uh, zoom it a little bit if it helps. So the, this, this is a list from a relatively recent paper. So this is, these are the formulas for the strain energy function, and it goes on and on and on, many of them. So people are trying to fit the experimental data. So again, uh, these are the papers or kind of summarizing the state of the art, uh, relatively recent given the, the age of, of the subject matter. Of course, also it's uh, it started, uh, started to be a pretty boring so there's a time for, uh, for the change of perspective. So the change of perspective, uh, many of you have uh, seen this picture. I like it very much. So this is, this is uh, something that illustrates the change of perspective, at least uh, to me. Right? So uh, in the whole history of art, people were painting crucifixion of Christ, right? So, you can uh, go to a church and uh, you will see three crosses, people suffering, uh, facial expressions, beautiful pieces of art. This is the same theme, crucifixion of Christ, but complete change of perspective, right? So this is the, the name of this picture is what our Lord saw from the cross. So what is important here that uh, the crucifixion is, is not there at all. Right, so it's uh, from from different point of view. This is, uh, I think, a very very strong uh, strong painting. Although the, the, the technical quality is not not, not great, uh, but uh, the the idea behind it is uh, is very nice. Okay, so for us, uh, I'll just uh, remark. So the rubber is still a subject of uh, uh, intensive research. And again, this is our favorite journal, again, Proceedings of Royal Society, Rubber Chemistry and Technology. So what people are trying to do just now is uh, instead of this one, they are trying to say that B is a function of T, for example. So change of perspective. So what was uh, in vogue for 50 years, that T is a function of deformation, stress is a function of deformation. Uh, it turns out that it also makes sense to uh, write the deformation as a function of stress. So if you are curious, you can go through this paper. So uh, this is kind of interesting because, well, you can ask, okay, after 50 years, or more than 50 years, after 70 years, what you can add to the modeling of rubber? Well, it turns out that uh, you can add a lot. But let's, uh, let's do a different thing. And uh, now uh, comes time for, for equations, at least for some uh, sort of equations. But don't worry, don't, don't, don't leave the lecture. Uh, it will be very simple stuff. So we are going back to our another uh, favorite material. This is steel. Uh, and for steel, uh, the important phenomenon is plasticity. So what it is, so the players here are, again, the deformation and stress. 
And uh, the control variable here is the deformation. So uh, you are deforming the material and you, you are recording uh, the stress. And the steel does the following thing. So first you will see, okay, in the idealized world, of course, uh, first you will see a uh, uh, linear relation between the, uh, the deformation and the stress. Then, the whole thing reaches some yield stress. This is called, uh, this is uh, called yield stress. And then the material starts to flow. So the stress is constant and the epsilon is increasing. And of course you can cycle the material like this. And this is a kind of general ph phenomenon. You will see the hysteresis in, in many systems. And the question is how to model it. So I'll show you that uh, even in this very simple problem, a lot of things can be done. But uh, in order to do that, you must be a little bit familiar with, uh, with the standard concept. So this is uh, a, a copy of a page from a book that is, or a chapter that is called History of Plasticity. So this is the picture I was trying to, to draw, right? So this is the yield stress, uh, uh, the deformation. And uh, the, the basic idea behind many theories of plasticity is the following. You have your player, this is deformation, and this is decomposed to the elastic and plastic part. So instead of just one quantity, epsilon, was uh, in the Hooke's law, we were doing something like this. We knew what is epsilon, we knew what is sigma, you can measure both, so we are happy. So now you are introducing a decomposition and you are introducing two new players into the field. The elastic part of the deformation, plastic part of the deformation. So this is, this is the basic idea behind many theories of plasticity, successful theories of plasticity. Don't worry, it's, uh, they are not uh, completely wrong, but they are using this concept. Now the question is, okay, so if, uh, if uh, you want to work just with, uh, with stress and the deformation, whether there's a chance to overcome this decomposition, whether you can work just with epsilon and then sigma, just these two quantities, no uh, decomposition to elastic and plastic part and this kind of stuff. So this is the equation that will do, do the job, right? So the, the players here are epsilon and sigma. H is a side step function. So side is uh, something like this. So this is zero and then jumps to one, zero, one. And this is a rate type equation. And if you solve it, you will get the picture I was showing you on the first uh, slide uh, that was devoted to plasticity. And there's nothing like epsilon uh, E and epsilon P in that equation. And uh, I think it's quite instructive to see how it works. Right? So what, what, what it tells us, so let's start with, with the picture. So here are the players, epsilon, sigma. This is uh, the yield stress. And let us think that uh, the epsilon is increasing, right? So we are below yield stress. and the material is being loaded. So stigma is positive, so it essentially means that the epsilon d is greater than zero. So in this case, so we are below yield stress, so this is zero, and the material is loaded, so this is also zero. So in this case, 
we will get a simple equation E is the epsilon dt. And this is nothing than uh, the derivative of our favorite uh, Hooke's law, right? So the rate version of Hooke's law. So we are doing this bang. Then we hit the yield uh, stress value. So this is this one. So this becomes one. And the material is still being loaded. Epsilon is increasing. So in this case, the equation reduces to d sigma dt is zero, right? Because we have one minus one is zero. So d sigma dt is zero. So sigma is constant, epsilon is increasing. Yeah. Now, uh, you can, investigate what happens if the epsilon dt is decreasing. So we are unloading the material. We have reached the maximum value of epsilon and we are unloading. So this one is switched off or switched on, sorry. Uh, so d epsilon dt is uh, less than zero. So this is zero. We are below, well, zero times whatever is uh, still zero. So again, we are effectively solving this one. So it means again that sigma is e epsilon and the whole thing continues on a line. Right? It's simple as that. Right? So there's no, uh, there's no need to introduce uh, plastic flow, uh, elastic, uh, elastic deformation, plastic deformation, other, de other decomposition, uh, and so on and so on. This, this simple equation will do the job. Uh, and of course, so there's, well, there's one problem with that. Uh, this is on the level of Hooke's law. So it's 1D, uh, 1D equation. Uh, so who cares, right? So we want uh, 3D finite deformations. So this can be done. So if you are interested, the, the, the corresponding system looks like this. What is important here that again, you, are, you have just two quantities, stress, and a kind of deformation, nothing else. Okay, but uh, let's go back to rubber. It's a, a problem that is related to, a, to this. Uh, rubber is our favorite substance. So let us see what, what is really happening in rubber if you subject it to cycles. So the, the picture, that is of interest here is this one. So again, our femoral quantities, epsilon and sigma. So epsilon is prescribed as a function of time, right? So this is a function that is uh, uh, of this pattern. So we have triangles and the maximum is increasing. And if you subject uh, your uh, elastic medium, probably uh, the rubber to this kind of input. So we are deforming it according to this, uh, uh, this plot. Then what is happening? First, uh, sigma is changing with epsilon. This is some nonlinear curve. You can even think about, uh, about a line. So elasticity, bang, we hit point A here, and we are unloading. And we are unloading along a different path, this one. Then we hit zero. Then we go to the second cycle. From zero, we are going to, uh, we are going upwards. And in the second cycle, we are not following the top line. We are following the bottom line, right? So, First cycle was this one. Second cycle is this one. Then you go back to that original point and then you are continuing along the top curve. And then 
you reach this point and you are unloading and you are unloading along this trajectory. You get to zero and you are starting to load the material and the loading path is this one. Bang. And it's still rubber. It's, it's, so this is uh, definitely something else than epsilon sigma and you are done some nonlinear function even in this 1D setting. Uh, the behavior of rubber can be quite complicated. So this is this is the message, and uh, the keyword. If you want to uh, want to check how it is called, the keyword here is Malin's effect. Malin's effect is basically the thing that uh, I have described just now. So this cycling of material, and again uh, with the Malin's effect, uh, there are models for that. There are substantially younger than, than models for, uh, for elasticity and inelasticity. So the first kind of successful model comes from 1999. And uh, the, the original experiment are, experiments are from 1970s. This is an experiment by Mullins. And uh, since then, people are trying to, to develop models, good models uh, for uh, this behavior. Okay, so uh, you can do that with a very, uh, very simple trick, uh, at least in 1D. So basically what you need is that if you have a given curve that is top envelope, and you have a curve that is bottom envelope, you need to first, uh, uh, develop a tool that will allow you to transfer uh, your system from the top envelope to the bottom envelope. Uh, you can do it. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a very, uh, very simple, simple algebra actually. So uh, your task, uh, still have some time. So, so your task uh, is uh, to develop an equation that will allow you to transfer sigma to the prescribed curve B of epsilon T. So this is very easy. Uh, so your differential equation is D sigma DT, oh, sorry. D DT sigma minus b epsilon of t squared is minus sigma minus b epsilon t squared. That's it, right? So uh, the long-term dynamics that is governed by this equation is that the sigma will finally go to the curve that is prescribed here. Of course, there is some but. Uh, now uh, here comes the critical trick. You need to make it rate independent. So you will add a magical term here, the epsilon dt norm. It makes the, the switching between two curves rate independent process. And then you will differentiate. And uh, your equation will get finally is minus, so, so there's some transition constant kappa here, sigma minus b epsilon t plus b epsilon b epsilon dt norm. And you are done. Right? So if, if, you, if you differentiate the stuff, um, Oh, sorry. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, so I'll write it carefully once again. So d sigma dt is in this case b epsilon d epsilon dt minus kappa half sigma b epsilon norm of d epsilon dt. And this is, this is the equation that, uh, that will do the transition magic from one curve to the other. 
So you can use it as a building block for, for the differential equation of this type. Right? So instead of working with uh, some chain of inequalities uh, and uh, with the relation between the stress and strain, you can work with the rate type quantities, with the derivatives, the evolution in time. Uh, but still, this is rate independent equation, as you can easily check the derivative in each term. And this will do the transition. And uh, if you add some, some other magic, the, then the result uh, is the following, right? So I'll try to run some, uh, some simple, uh, simple simulation. So can you see some, uh, some animation? It's not running just now, but uh, can you see the picture? Yes. So just a second, I need to, okay. So these are two, uh, what we have here are two curves, uh, the top envelope and bottom envelope. The top envelope is dotted, and the bottom envelope is dashed and uh, you are loading the material. So it goes up. Now it's being unloaded, so it switches to the bottom curve and it goes back to the origin. Now the second cycle takes place. So in the second cycle of loading, uh, the, the curve is the bottom one. Once you reach the, the, the value here, it switches to the top curve and the same thing, right? Bang. So with a single uh, ODE. So, so this, this is the business uh, 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 you can generalize uh, to the fully 3D setting and you will have a, a rate model for the Mullins effect. Of course, uh, other things uh, need to be added, but uh, I guess it's no time to do it uh, here. So it's time to conclude. So this, this was the last equation, right? So the, the only a little bit technical stuff, but uh, this, is, uh, this is something that is definitely within the reach of uh, students uh, in the second year, uh, first year of their study here at the Faculty of Mathematics Physics. So th this, this is the idea that will do the job, right? And uh, uh, you can see uh, curves of this type uh, in various applications not only elasticity, uh, the, this kind of hysteresis or, uh, or memory appears in, in many systems. And uh, in every field, basically, people have the same uh, different set of tricks uh, how, to, how to attack these problems. Some of them are uh, very involved from a mathematical point of view. Uh, but uh, you can do everything with a, with a, single, a single ordinary differential equation. So this is the most advanced stuff I will show you today. So it's time to conclude. Uh, so I hope that you are now convinced that the continuum mechanics is a vigorous research field, right? So it seems that it's uh, an old subject. But everything has been done. Uh, this is uh, far from true. There are still problems that uh, need to be solved, uh, even in modeling of the response of materials. Uh, there are many new ideas that are in play. I've shown you some of them. Uh, so it means that there's a chance to do interesting work with kind of limited technical skills. So still everything depends on the meaning, not on the technical mastery, but also the technical skills are important. Don't misunderstand me. And uh, all you are going to do are the phenomena that uh, you can see on the ordinary time scale and on the ordinary length scale, right? So this is the behavior, this is about the behavior of materials that is completely accessible to uh, human experience, right? So it's nothing like uh, uh, quantum effects or uh, general relativity, you can really see it and uh, if you want, you can do still the experiment with, uh, uh, with very uh, primitive uh, uh, primitive equipment. Okay, so uh, 
this is this is about uh, continuum mechanics and some some opportunities for further research so thank you very much for coming uh, and if you have questions i'll be happy to answer them <laughs>